At the Touchstone School in Grafton, Massachusetts, five-year-old Seth is about to discover that his imagination can create problems. Seth enjoys learning and plays well with his classmates. At this age, boys and girls prefer the company of their own gender. The girls, on average, are up to a year ahead of the boys in verbal and fine motor skills. And there are psychological differences as well. While boys and girls still play games like hide and seek together, their fantasy lives have begun to differ. I want to hear from Rachel Ray. Seth's teacher, Jane Catch, sees these differences emerge in the stories that the children create. Each morning, I have the kids come to this table and tell me a story. And I write it down in their words. What's um, what's this? A panda. Then an elephant came over. And then an elephant came over. They all had a sleepover. Girls tend to tell stories about friendship and family. Boys' stories are often much more dramatic, but lots of conflict and violence. Now, we have a lot of stories from this morning. Jane wrote a wonderful book, Under Dead Man's Skin, about boys' fantasy, the problems they can create, and the best way to handle them. So we left off with Seth? Okay, yeah. very good. There was a unicorn, and its friend was a horse. And the horse got killed by a very old man. The unicorn killed the old man. And then the unicorn lived happily ever after. Almost all the girls agreed that this made them sad. What about you, Lydia? It, feels, it makes me feel bad for the horse and the old man because I really live on a horse farm and I really care about horses more than anything in the whole world and I really don't like that part. That idea spread very quickly among the girls that the boys shouldn't tell these violent stories. I agree with Lydia. So horses are really important to you? Yeah, I agree with okay. Lydia too. Okay. <laughs> Seth said he really wanted it to be that way. That he didn't feel okay about just having the old man faint, which was what the girls wanted the solution to be. In many schools, teachers simply impose a solution. No violent story is allowed. But Jane believes that it's important for the children to work through the issue themselves, even though it can be a struggle. And Seth, what about you? I like it when people don't change the story. Okay, so he told his story, and he doesn't want people to change it. Now we have a real problem to solve. Well, um, Emily... And then Kelly. So the author's right to tell a meaningful story the way it feels right seemed very clear. At the same time, um, the intensity of the kids' wishes to not have violence that made them uncomfortable also seemed really important. And I don't know how they're going to solve that problem. I left the class at this point to fetch a scholar with special insight into the issue. Tom Newkirk teaches writing at the University of New Hampshire. In his remarkable book, Misreading Masculinity, Tom argues that boys lag behind girls in literacy, largely because teachers discourage them from reading and writing about the things they're interested in. There are schools that want to eliminate violence in writing. I say, are you going to eliminate violence in reading, too? That would cut out everything. That would cut out, you know, 90% of the plots that have ever been written. I think. Violent writing tests our fear, it tests, it, you know, we're exploring our fears, the fear of death. You and Jane are some of the only two people I know who are willing to come out in print and say, this is what boys want to talk about and write about. It's, it's part of human nature to be fascinated with, with death, with battles, and I don't think that interest turns you into uh, to killers. I don't think there's some limits you have to set. For example, I don't think you could have a violent story in a classroom where another kid in the class is the object of that violence. How did you come to your understanding that it was okay, that it wasn't dangerous? 
Well, I was partly thinking of what I was like as a kid. You know, I was into violence. I was into cowboys and Indians. Uh, I had my pistols, you know. I had the whole, the whole works. And, and, we, and I didn't turn into a killer. When I returned with Tom, we got a surprise. The class had decided that there could be no more stories about dying, only fainting. With Jane's permission, we asked the children to talk about their decision. Erica, do you ever write stories about animals dying? You never do. What about fainting? Is fainting as good as dying in a story? No, why isn't it as good? Because they don't, they just run out of breath. Like, you're running and, and, and you have to slow down. And that's fainting. And, and, and how's dying different from fainting? You die. All right, let's go. What about kindergarten stories about death? Well, I wonder whether death in these stories is similar to death when they're out in the playground and, you know, you die, you, bow, you, you know, fall down, then you're up again. It's not a real thing. It's play. I know so many parents who are upset by that. I think that uh, they're upset because they think that this kind of play will lead to real-life aggression. <laughs> Most boys have a sense of what's reality and what's fantasy and what's play and what's real. So does this mean it's okay to expose children to violent TV, movies, and video games? Jane cautions that images of graphic violence can be harmful to children under seven. The violence in their inner life doesn't have a lot of gore at age five. It doesn't have blood. And so when they see the violence in the movies, it makes a change in their fantasy life that I think is really troublesome to them. I think it's really scary to them. But as much as we need to protect boys from the worst of media violence, we must be careful not to stifle their natural fantasy life. Sure enough, when Seth goes to write another story, it's clear that the no dying rule causes him problems. It was another horse. It was another horse. But it got painted. The horse got fainted. How come it got fainted? I've never seen him hesitate like that. Usually he comes, sits down at the table, he's got his story, he tells it, and it feels great to him, you can tell. And this time he couldn't figure out what to say. Usually you just sit down and you tell your story. And this seems like much harder today to tell your story than usual. Is that because you wanted to say it got killed, but the girls didn't like it the other day? No. I don't know. You don't know why? Okay. It's very confusing to little boys growing up now, because on one hand, all around them, they see violence. On the news, in the movies, on video games. And at the same time, they're getting the message that the fantasies that boys seem to have always had are bad. Here's another problem that came up. And it so came Jane up decides to reopen the discussion about violence in stories. Oh, should make a rule that uh, nice guys can't get killed? You should make a rule Wait, would you say, wait a minute, would you finish the chewing? The nice guy can't get killed. Okay. I don't like when people who are good get killed or animals get killed, because they're good. If they kill people, because people are made of God and God's good. What about bad guys? I don't mind them getting killed. And what about bad guys getting killed? I don't mind that. I don't mind the bad guys getting killed because they're bad. Now, is there anybody who has a problem with acting out the, all the stories with only the bad guys dying and no good guys dying? 
Is there anybody who has a problem with that? Even Seth seems to be okay with the new rule. You're all okay with that? Great. All right, then we solved the problem that we were having for such a long time. I think the danger is giving the boys who are having those thoughts the idea that it says something bad about them as people. This, for me, is the crux of the issue. Our schools have to make the distinction between actual violence, which must be discouraged, and fantasy violence, which should be accommodated. Otherwise, we risk giving boys one more reason to believe that school's not a place for them.